Yeah. Okay, right. for the this presentation, uh, Camille is going to talk us uh, to talk about experiments in ergodicity, uh, and this was supervised by Oli, Ole, Alex, Jonathan, <laughs> and Mark. So please, uh, Camille, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Yes. So uh, hello, everyone. So I'm going to start from explaining uh, what was the, uh, the aim of, of my project. So the aim was very simple. It was to improve what we called is the, uh, the Copenhagen experiment. Uh, so now what is the Copenhagen experiment? So it is the, uh, the experiment on, on choice, uh, on decision making, uh, which was uh, conducted in Copenhagen a few years ago uh, in, in Danish Research Center for Magnetic Resonance. Uh, here is the, the manuscript that will be uh, soon published from, from this experiment. So it, it's, it's being done with collaboration with people around the world and also uh, fellows from, uh, from the LML. And the uh, aim of the Copenhagen experiment was to validate the ergodic theory of decision-making. Uh, hey, I will uh, discuss this uh, throughout uh, my talk. And uh, now we can ask uh, why do we even care about improving the experiment? So a first reason is, is uh, that we want to address the criticism that uh, was uh, uh, that uh, we saw uh, uh, happened after the experiment. So, so after uh, this uh, manuscript was uh, made available. And uh, more importantly, we want to replicate the finding, the, the main finding of the experiment. So uh, before I, I explain uh, how we can improve the, the experiment, I have to uh, explain the, the experiment itself. So it's a gambling experiment uh, with real money. Uh, it's, and uh, it was held in, in Denmark. So uh, this, this uh, the money is, is Danish kronens, kronens. And it was divided into two separate days. Uh, in each day, a subject uh, experienced different wealth dynamics. So in the additive day, uh, subject wealth changed additively. So there were nine fractals, nine different stimuli, which were associated with this wealth changes. So each fractal meant different wealth change. So after applying this fractal, uh, a subject gained 428 kronos. And uh, in the multiplicative day, uh, wealth changed multiplicatively. So we again had nine, had nine uh, different fractals, each correspond, oops, which correspond to different wealth change. So after getting the best fractal, your wealth gets multiplied this time by the factor of two times uh, 23. And by getting the worst possible fractal in this day, uh, you lose uh, more than 50% of your wealth. And then each day was divided into two sessions, the passive session and the active session. Uh, in the passive session, a uh, subject just uh, had, had to passively learn how fractals work. So they just observed the sequence of fractals and associated wealth changes with those sequences. And after many, many trials, they learned uh, the meaning or the, the wealth change associated with each fractal. Uh, on the other hand, the active session uh, consisted of, uh, of choice trials where a subject had to make the decision. And um, here is the example trial. So subject need to choose between uh, the, the left gamble and the right gamble. So he can either choose left or right. And each gamble consisted of two fractals. And after the subject made a choice, then the coin was tossed and the random fractal from the chosen gamble was uh, selected to, to possibly affect wealth. So note that each gamble was mixed. So one fractal uh, was associated with, uh, with gains and the other with, uh, with loss. Okay, and uh, the, the last thing which will be important for the improvement of the experiment is that um, uh, not all trials, uh, first of all, in the active sessions, the outcome were hidden from subject throughout the entire experiment. So the, the, uh, only after the experiment end and uh, subject made all uh, of the choices, the final wealth was revealed. So they didn't know exactly uh, their wealth throughout the experiment. And uh, moreover, not all trials were affecting wealth. So only 10 out of, uh, I guess, 312 trials were selected and applied to final wealth. But, uh, but subject had to uh, uh, make uh, the best possible decision nonetheless, because they didn't know which, which trial will be selected to affect wealth. 
Okay, so uh, now uh, we can ask how this experiment allowed to uh, discriminate between models. So we have this, this prevailing uh, model in the, the, uh, the, the economics, uh, the model of choice under uncertainty called the expected utility theory. And the, the new model, uh, which I will discuss is the, the, I don't know if it's the name of the model, but it's the model that was created uh, within the, the framework of agodicity economics. And these models predict differently uh, when it comes to different wealth dynamics. So the expected utility theory predicts that the risk attitude uh, represented here by this parameter eta should be stable across different dynamics. So it, the EUT uh, says that the risk attitude is really the characteristic of, of individual and, and it, is, it should be stable. So it should be uh, fairly stable and it can differ, differ between different subjects, but uh, not between dynamics. On the other hand, we get this agodicity economics, uh, which um, states that uh, subjects are really trying to uh, maximize the, the uh, rate at which the wealth grows. And uh, it gives very specific prediction regarding the risk attitude when the dynamics change. For, for example, in the, multiple, in the additive dynamic, it predicts that subject to behave optimally in the in the, the like uh, in the growth manner should be a uh, risk neutral. On the other hand, in multiplicative, it should be risk averse, and the, the like the shape of this risk aversion. I will come to that later. It should be very specific for this dynamic in order to to maximize the the, the growth rate. Okay, and uh, this is the the same thing but um, uh, shown in a different way. So uh, this is the, the, posterior, the expected posterior distribution of risk aversion for, for both theories. And this is the added, uh, in the additive day and this is the multiplicative day. So E postulates that it should be zero for additive and one for multiplicative. So we should see that the fitted risk aversion should be somewhere around this point. On the other hand, EUT uh, says that it should be the same for different subjects, but different subjects can have different values Hence, we got this long diagonal because uh, different subjects may lie in different places on, on this diagonal. And result, uh, after the, the collecting the data and fitting the, 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 the Bayesian model, uh, the result showed that the posterior distribution of risk aversion is located here. So it's much, uh, it's even visually much closer to the EE. And it was obviously uh, shown using like rigorous uh, Bayesian methods that the EE model is, uh, is more likely to be the model uh, that is generating the data. And now uh, let's get back to the aim of, of my project. So now uh, at the onset of the project, we, uh, we try to figure out how to improve the experiment. And we had these three ideas and I will walk, walk you through uh, during my, the rem remaining of my talk. So first of all, it's very simple. We wanted to add more wealth dynamics and not only have two, but we only also wanted to have at least one uh, dynamic, which is uh, which encourages risk-seeking behavior. Uh, then we wanted to uh, to change the design slightly to to show all the outcomes and realize all trials. And finally, we wanted to optimize the design such we are, uh, have uh, greater probability to dis discriminate between competing models. Yeah. And uh, let's start from, from well dynamics. So the ergodicity economics, um, uh, really uh, one of the theorems says that there is a connection between the wealth dynamic and the, the ergodicity transformation on utility function. It's really a uh, different name for the same mathematical object. So I will use that uh, interchangeably. So uh, for a wealth dynamic, we can find a utility function such that if subject use this utility function, uh, he will be growth optimal in this world dynamic. On the other hand, for a, a, a utility function, we can find a dynamic in which um, a subject will behave uh, growth optimal. Yeah, and uh, this is exactly what, uh, what Alex was, uh, was mentioning during his talk on uh, Wednesday. And obviously with the, the, the utility function from the like psychological perspective, we have some associated risk attitude. And now we want to use the, this relationship going from right to left to use a well-known class of utility functions to create uh, uh, more wealth dynamics. So 
So this is exactly it. So we want to, uh, the utility function or the algorithmic transformation is just a function acting on wealth, uh, tra uh, transforming it to, to another value. And wealth dynamic is just a function that says how wealth grows over time. And we want to uh, go from here to here. Uh, okay, so uh, now the theorem says that, uh, um, that uh, we need to find a wealth dynamics, xt, uh, with the following property. So the transformed wealth should grow at a constant rate over time. And this is expressed as this, this derivative. In other words, we need to find a wealth function, xt, that, is, that will be linearized by applying the ergodicity transformation. And we can now use the definition of derivative and go to the... Uh, drop the limit, consider final wealth uh, to get this equation. And now after reorganize, reorganizing this equation, we get something like this. So we know we get the equation for updating a wealth after time delta t, which says that uh, we have to do three things basically. First, we need to transform the, the, uh, the initial wealth, then add the constant value times uh, um, amount of time elapsed, and then we, we should apply the uh, inverse uh, ergodicity transformation to go back to the wealth. And uh, we decided to use the well-known isoelastic utility also mentioned on Wednesday, uh, because uh, basically it's the most, uh, most, popular, uh, iso uh, most popular utility function. So uh, it will be easy to, uh, for everyone uh, to understand that. It has some nice properties, and uh, but to be honest, it has some also some some bad properties. But uh, we um, decided to to stick stick with that. And uh, if we plug it uh, plug this uh, this um, uh, utility function into the equation bottom, we get something like this. And let's pause for pause for a second and uh, try to um, uh, understand why this is so useful to do for creating new dynamics. So first of all. By changing the, the gamma, which is the growth rate, we can create different uh, wealth changes. So it would correspond to different fractals, which then allow us to uh, create new gambles. So if we set the growth rate to zero, we get this middle fractal, which uh, doesn't affect a wealth. So, so after applying this fractal, wealth don't change doesn't change. And uh, if the growth rate is positive, then uh, we get fractals that increase our wealth. And if the, uh, the, the parameter is negative, we get fractal which decrease our wealth. And by changing the other parameter, eta, which we know is the risk uh, attitude in isoelastic, we can manipulate this, uh, this wealth dynamic. So we can change the way how, how wealth grows over time when uh, these, um, these changes are applied sequentially. So uh, and the, the nicest thing uh, about the isoelastic is that we can recover uh, the two cases that uh, we previously had uh, in, in the Copenhagen experiment, meaning the additive dynamic for uh, zero risk attitude and multiplicative for one. And we can also get something in between those two. And we can get a, a whole range of different uh, risk seeking dynamics for, for negative values of this parameter. And because uh, we all like symmetry and we wanted at least one uh, dynamic which encourages risk seeking uh, behavior. We uh, chose uh, to the final experiment these three. So yeah, we added new risk seeking dynamic for, for this parameter. Okay, so now let's move to the, uh, to the second point, which is this problem of trial realization. So if we, um, uh, when we design a, a, a gambling experiment, uh, any gambling experiment, we have basically two choices to make. So we have to uh, decide if we, uh, how many trials we really realize. So uh, we might uh, realize uh, only one and then uh, just uh, see how subject would behave in different trials, but assuming that only one trial will be realized and we can hide or show the out outcome. So, so we can uh, provide this um, constant feedback loop for the subject or we can hide and uh, like in Copenhagen experiments show the, the final wealth after the, the, the experiment ends. And here, uh, here was the, the Copenhagen experiment and with, with new experiments, we want to move up to this corner to realize all trials and show all the outcomes. And now let's uh, think, uh, let's um, um, try to uh, 
I will try to explain why this is so useful and what advantages and possible challenges are associated with uh, this decision regarding the paradigm. So first of all, it's, it's uh, obviously more realistic because in real life we usually have this, uh, this um, like constant feedback. We can see uh, how well, how wealthy we are. We can see how much resources we, we got, so on. And it, it's definitely more engaging because uh, you can imagine that, that the game uh, which subjects are playing is more exciting if they can like uh, see at each trial if they gained or lost. Um, and uh, we can also include uh, by doing this, which is the, the more important, I think, uh, we can include this temporal and wealth dependency effect. And what is, for example, the wealth dependency effect? So we know from the theory that the wealth uh, should um, uh, influence the choice. So we can imagine that we have um, an agent with fixed risk attitude, and uh, it's, it's, it faces some gamble pair. And it turns out that depending on the wealth, the, his choice can be different. So if he has like, I don't know, 1,000 krona, he might uh, choose the left gamble because it's, it's more profitable for him. But if he has like 3,000, it might be more beneficial to choose right gamble. And if we hide the outcomes from participants, uh, we cannot really uh, believe that this, or it's, it's more difficult to believe that this effect uh, will happen because uh, really subjects have no idea what uh, wealth they currently possess. And what are the challenges um, related to, to this approach? So first, it's very difficult to control the trajectory of, uh, of wealth. Uh, because the, the changes are so frequent that it's e easy to uh, either go bankrupt or exceed uh, a, a fixed amount that is uh, that we have uh, for uh, for one participant. So it's it's especially difficult to control control the bankruptcy problem in the risk seeking dynamic because the the changes in wealth are more steep when we have a low wealth. So you can imagine that. Uh, the subject is just unlucky and hits like three, uh, three times in a row, uh, the, the worst fractal and then he bankrupt and we cannot, uh, from the ethical reasons, for example, cannot include the possibility of having debt. And also in the, for example, multiplicative dynamics, it's very easy to control the, the max payout because if you multiply something many, many times, you can easily imagine how, how fast it can grow. And there are also some drawbacks of this part, of this design that are potential compounds from emotional process and probability matching, which is for probability matching is the, the, the seeing the uh, pattern in randomness, which are not there and subjects are prone to that. And, but this is the problem, uh, general problem in, in this type of experiments. And uh, we figure out very, very simple solution, which turns out to work very well with uh, our next idea, which I'll discuss uh, when I will talk about the third point. So we just uh, said that, okay, so when subject bankrupt, so he hits zero wealth or exceeds some max payout that's intended for him, the experiment just ends. So you can see this simulated wealth trajectories, some of them made up until the end of the experiment and some of them, the red ones, uh, went bankrupt at some point and the experiment just ended there. And uh, it's similar for the, uh, the green ones which exceeded uh, 4,000 kron. And so let's move on to the last point which really brings uh, together all those uh, previous ideas. So uh, what does it mean to optimize the experimental design uh, which, which were when the experiment is meant to discriminate between competing models. So good experiments simply would provide a data that allow to, to, uh, to be sure that we can discriminate between the competing models. So uh, we can think of a very bad experimental design, which has the property that it produces the same predictions for a competing model, then it's, it's terrible design. So using that simple idea, uh, we can uh, introduce the measure of disagreement. So it's based on the simple heuristics that uh, simulated uh, responses from the ergodicity economic agents should differ from the expected utility theory agent responses. So just if we simulate both agents, the response to, to the same, uh, same sequence of stimuli should be different. So here we get uh, some experimental design consisting of like let's say 10 trials. Each trial uh, consists of uh, two gambles. So it's just a gamble pair. 
And we simulate the EUT responses and the E response and just uh, calculate the probability or the frequency uh, of uh, the inter disagreement. So the, when one agent chose left and the other chose right. So in this case, it will be 30%. Uh, and we can then tweak the experiment to uh, try to increase that even further. And uh, why it goes so well with this bound idea? Because let's imagine that we have this, uh, we have fractals which has very large growth rates and the, the, we have really high chance to, uh, for the agent to go bankrupt really uh, fast. So let's say the EUT agent went bankrupt after two trials and the E uh, went bankrupt after three trials. Then we are losing all these remaining trials which, oops, which previously contributed to disagreement. So, uh, but because of this, uh, like truncating the experiment, we are uh, we uh, decreasing the uh, the disagreement. So the the disagreement really combines these two ideas into one. So it combines the idea of uh, of the difference between models and the uh, the the effect of uh, ending the experiment uh, too soon because of the uh, the large growth rates associated with fractals. In this case, the disagreement would drop to 0 0.1. Therefore, this design would be uh, worse. And these three things really uh, gives us the, the, the optimization framework. So it goes like this. We got some experimental design, which consists of trials, of fractals, and so on. Then we can simulate responses. Then we can calculate the disagreement between competing models. And then we can improve So by switching this this knobs and, and switches by turning these knobs, we can, for example, uh, change the amount, uh, change the growth rates for the fractals, change the number of trials, number of fractals, whatever we want. And then we can just get, get back to this agreement and see if we uh, improved or not. Uh, and uh, I will briefly discuss one of the, the possible knobs that we, uh, we played around because it's, um, uh, so, so the, the project now is the, uh, the stage of the project is that we have like code written for all of this and now we're trying to really uh, think really hard and figure out what uh, which of these knobs and switches uh, should we like uh, consider worth uh, turning to, to see if, if we improved. So uh, this is the gamble space. Uh, this is the, our representation of po all possible gambles and uh, the x-axis correspond to right fractal or the, the I should say fractal on the bottom and the uh, y-axis correspond to fractal on the top. And these are the growth rates associated with fractals and the color corresponds to average growth rate for the gamble. And now we, they edge in the space. So, so if we connect two dots, it represents a pair of gambles. So the experiment is really uh, consisting of all, all of possible, uh, of set of possible edges that we can draw in this 2D space. And now we can, for example, take all, again, all mixed gambles as in original Copenhagen experiment and just tweak uh, the, the max growth rate for the fractal. So we can, for example, uh, increase this to 400. So it would mean that the wealth, the wealth changes would be more drastic or we can decrease it to like 50. And uh, after calculating the disagreement for all these possible values of this, the C is, is just a, a max value of this growth rate. Uh, and we can see that there is a, somewhere here the sweet spot for the where the, the maximal disagreement between competing models is reached. So if we go from zero, that disagreement is really, really low uh, because uh, like all agents agree on, on the, the same gambles. Then we reach the, the, this, this uh, maximum and then we decrease and we can see from the right plot, which shows the probability of uh, going bankrupt or exceeding this, this upper bound. Uh, we go uh, lower in this agreement because the more and more trajectories are, uh, are prone to this, uh, this uh, ending fast because of the hitting, hitting of the bound problem. Yeah, so uh, that's just one example and that's basically it. it. And at the end, I'd like to thank to all my supervisors uh, for the help and, and all the useful advice. And then special uh, thanks to Oli Kulma uh, for really countless hours of discussion on, on, on this uh, project, uh, which really enabled us to, to advance uh, the project to the, the current stage. Yeah, so that's it. Okay, thank you, uh, Camille, for uh, 
again, this is a very nice, very neat presentation. Congratulations to you and to your uh, supervisors uh, for the project. So it's, it is time for questions. We have five minutes. So you know the drill, guys. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I've got one quick question. Um, uh, very nice presentation, Camille. I was just wondering about the um, the truncation. So, um, is the intention to tell the subjects that uh, there are these upper and lower bounds? And if you do tell them, then does this does this somehow change their behaviour? And if you don't tell them, is there an ethical problem? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the, the 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 one issue related to that this this bound solution we really are trying to figure out because. Uh, as you mentioned, if we tell them that, uh, then they can change behavior because they are not trying to maximize like the growth over time over a very long period of time because they know that it will be truncated when they hit like 4K and uh, they may start to behave different differently uh, when they are close to the bounds. And on the other hand, uh, we cannot really uh, uh, trick them and just uh, don't mention that the bounds. So, we try to come up with some uh, like solution in the middle that to, to say that to like say um, something which is true, but it's not directly saying that the experiment will end whenever they hit 4K. So um, it's really try, trying to trick them, but uh, if we can get away with that, uh, we should be fine. <laughs> okay, so you'll, you'll have some sort of politician's statement about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very good. Um, I think Colin Colin put his hand up as well. Colin, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask exactly the same question, so Camille has just answered it. Okay, more questions? I see none. So if that's so, so shall we thank Camille for this fantastic uh, project and the, the very nice presentation. Thank you very much, Camille.